Welcome back to the BDG Redraft channel. Not Dynasty. <laughs> Y'all had me twisted for a second with you on the couch. We haven't done a lot of redraft content together, but today we're going to get into a little top 25 wide receiver debate, and we're going to do the same thing with running backs next episode. So if you want to hear that, subscribe to the channel. As always, these are my co-hosts, Adam and Andrew. They have their own Dynasty channel, so if you're looking for that content, Hi. go do your thing. All right, so we've just got the 25. We have 28 only because anyone that I had, anyone that had someone in the 25 at the cutoff, I wanted to like have them in the list, and we can kind of just talk about that a little further down. So you got a little treat today. You got the uh, top 28 consensus wide receivers from the boys. That, that, that's actually, I'm glad you did that because I had two people at 26 and 27. It was really hard for me to distinguish between 25. So duh. yeah, they're all kind of down there. Uh, in a muck and we'll kind of just run through any of the biggest differences that we see and, and kind of yap about why we uh already placed them where we did we have cd lamb's consensus one i have tyreek as my one y'all both have cd i don't think you're gonna lose your league with uh with either player i think back-to-back -back 17 hundos for tyreek hill on what i would say was almost like a disappointing year for tyreek hill given all things considered like 2k was very much in his range of outcomes yeah. so I, I see no reason why that um, can't be like a, a yardage area that he approaches. Again, CD was fucking awesome too. I don't think we need to waste a ton of time, but do you guys have any strong takes on why, why the flip? I do, but I'm curious. I'll let you rip, rip if you have something. They are the only two guys in my tier one wide receivers. I uh, don't really yeah. care which one you pick, but I lean Lamb. And I think it's mainly just because the competition that he's going to be competing with for targets is not Jalen Waddle, and that is Fair. the difference maker for me. That's a good point. So – C.D. Lamb, uh, I did a breakdown on South Harmon. C.D. Lamb last year was one of three receivers to actually go over 400 fantasy points ever in points per game. Yeah, it didn't make sense. 400 ever in For the points. season, for the entire season. 400 points four, per game. Four, I'm sorry, I did say points per game. That's no sleep. In points scored <laughs> for the season. 400 points for the season. We're giving you no sleep stats over here. Let's go, baby. Yeah, all right, let me, let me reel yeah, that yeah. back in. Points for the whole season, 400. Three times it's happened. Jerry Rice, Cooper Cup in that 21 season, C.D. Lamb. Damn. Further, depicting that out, there was a tale of like two halves, not midway through the season, but before the bye and after the bye, with the Cowboys the way they ran things. post buy, C.D. Lamb in 11 weeks, 313 fantasy points. That almost makes the list of like the best fantasy seasons we've ever seen from the wide receiver position. 11 weeks? Yeah. Yes. That's fucking insane. That's actually because I was looking at uh, quarterback performances fantasy-wise, like the best of all time. And I remember, like, Cam had one of the best years during his MVP yep. years, and he was at, like, 395. So, so to have a wide receiver get up to there is, yeah, that's pretty fucking outrageous. Three, like, to context, 313 in 11 weeks, there's only, like, I think three receivers that gave you 300 points last season as a whole. Yeah. Like, this man, I, I think he could end up being on a different planet. It's actually not a knock on Tyreek, because I think Tyreek was on pace for 2K. Like, they're in, they're in a... Tier one and everyone else is in tier three for me for redraft, but it wasn't until I started really digging into the numbers. I'm like, damn, this CD shit is crazy. Nah, that, that's kind of wild. And the, and the reason that I would almost feel confident that we see that type of performance again is because I would almost say the first half prior to those 11 weeks was the outlier and the fact that I don't think they really knew what their offense they was yet. They tried to force a run game. They, yeah, they, they tried to force it at Tony P. Didn't work. They knew what it. They knew what the identity they wanted it to be. It was just it was terrible. Right. So now I feel more confident that they'll go past heavy and kind of continue that streak. So we got Fair. CD, Tyreek, Jamar Chase across the board. Amon Ra, Justin Jefferson, AJ Brown, Garrett Wilson, Puka, Marvin Harrison, Devontae Adams are our consensus top ten. Not a lot of differing there. Anything that you guys want to touch on that you feel like? I'm stands just out? curious where you where, how you guys feel about Jefferson for the season this year. Like obviously the talent is ridiculous. No debate there. Dude, putting him at four hurt my heart. Okay. I, I'm not going to lie, but I, I have him at four. You guys have him at five. I just swapped him with Amon Ra compared to where you guys have them. I think that's just based off of I – mean, there's nothing negative, I guess, to say about either of these guys. I think it's more so maybe slight homerism, but also we've seen Justin Jefferson be, like, the number one for years. So I, 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 don't, I don't look at him that dissimilarly to the way I looked at, like, going uh, – Devontae Adams going into last year. For me, obviously a better tier, younger, like, more explosive – but last year, it was like, people were taking him in the first round. And my thought process was like, yeah, he's Devontae Adams. He's going to give you those like eight for 160 and two touchdown weeks. But I think his weekly floor, having Jimmy G as a quarterback, is going to be a problem for him. So Jefferson's going to have weeks where he goes for, you know, 10 for 180 and a couple touchdowns. But I think because of the way that the offense is set up and because of the way that we don't really know how they're going to operate, yeah. like he'll probably have games that are not to the level of his talent. And, and the reality is last year, yeah. you know, he dealt with a lot of – QB carousel last year with Josh Dobbs and Nick Mullins and Jaron Hall and all these guys that played quarterback for the Vikings. And this year he's probably going to have two quarterbacks 
probably Darnold to start and then McCarthy after. And I would hope that Darnold and McCarthy are upgrades to what Mullins and Dobbs are. If they aren't, that's a major failure for the Vikings. But I I just think the reality is you can't put this guy lower than five. And and you guys have him Uh, at five. Yeah. No, uh, the reason I want to talk about him. Still going to be good. You guys already kind of touched on it actually well enough. For me, it's just that I, I put him here. I can't put him below this. I don't. I'm not even trying to argue that. I just don't know that he actually has the ceiling. Not that his talent doesn't, that the other guys ahead of him do in situation. That's my only yeah, – that, lo- that's why I have him at five. Actually. Bro, I'm looking at his game logs. He, he still went ham down the stretch game, for the Game record. one, nine for 150. Game two, <laughs> 11 for 159. Game three, seven for 149. Then it's uh, – game four, six for 85, two touchdowns. Then it goes 28 yards, 27 yards. 84, 141. 192 we, to end the season, like week 18. God, he's so fucking good. Did, it, week 18 was at, week 18 was after the fantasy playoffs, but I remember he went like bananas that game. 12, right? 192 and a touchdown. Yeah, yeah. banged up. Different quarterbacks that was what, don't matter. Justin yeah. Jefferson's him. He's yeah. well. That's the thing. He is absolutely him. Talent wise, he can do it on his own. I just the other guys I think are immensely talented ahead of him, and their situations are better. I, I'm actually difference. what I think would, I'd be more interested to know is kind of where you guys are tier breaking these guys for drafts because yeah, for yeah. me it's Lamb Hill tier break, and then I have a group of Chase Brown, Jefferson, and AJ Brown. I have AJ Brown in that tier as well, and that's a tier break for me. Yeah. yeah. I actually have it. I think I go CD Lamb, Tyreek, and then I go Chase Aminra, and then I go Jefferson, AJ Brown. Okay. And then I, I think Garrett Wilson is dangerously close for me now, getting to that AJ Brown level. I just haven't seen it yet, but I think it's going to come. Okay. Yeah. I, I think I probably lean more towards your tier, where it's those four guys together in the middle Chase, Brown, Jefferson, AJ Brown, mm-hmm. uh, and then getting on to the next two, like Wilson and Puka together. So we have Adams at 10. We have. Ayuk, Drake London, Chris Olave, Mike Evans, Nico Collins as our next five. And the biggest discrepancy here is we finally have like a Olave. a decently big discrepancy. Yeah. Me and Andrew both have Olave as wide receiver 12. So a, a, a wide receiver one. You have him down at 16. Yep. It's not huge, but like in this capacity, that's uh, a relatively big. It, it might big, be a tear break. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Big, it's a big change. So Chris Olave, really talented player. I, I love the talent. I just last year, wide receiver anywhere 16 to 20 based on the scoring. Two years ago, wide receiver 25. I think really talented, but I don't think much has changed in the situation for me to say that he's going to be a top 12 fantasy finisher. And when I'm just talking about a one-year sprint, like Mike Evans, Mike Evans, in, in, unless he has a really bad performing touchdown season, he's going to do that. 1,000 yards every single season he's played. A lot of times, double-digit touchdowns. Uh, Nico Collins with the situation he's still in, I still really like him. Like it, it's actually not a knock on Chris Olave. I just think that I think the community is a general in general, both redraft and dynasty. There's just a lot of name cachet where it's not mm-hmm. that he's not talented. I don't know that it's going to come to fruition. Yeah, I feel that. I feel like watching Olave last year, watching the Saints offense, like they were completely broken. But I f- I felt like between Olave and Derek Carr's injuries, they left so much meat on the bone there. Yep. Yeah, there were so many like catches that were one foot out of bounds, a bunch of touchdown catches or Alave injury. And then Carr was like banged up for, it, it felt like everything went wrong for Alave and Carr and had a mm-hmm. few things broken, right? Like Alave would have been like a 1300 yard receiver and a, a much better upside. But I do agree. Like the upside is probably overblown at this point, given the yeah. situation hasn't changed at all. I, and I think a lot of, at least part of my ranking is like when I'm looking at these elite wide receivers or, or the top wide receivers that I'm going to have to spend high draft capital on in my drafts, mm-hmm. I want to know, that this guy is going to be the number one option in his offense. I want to know he's going to get a lot of targets. I want to know I can rely on him to be my number one wide receiver for my fantasy team. And you look at this Saints offense. I mean, for what it's worth, Michael Thomas is out of town. He's not going to be there anymore. And Juwan Johnson, the tight end who's kind of shown flashes at times, he just had a foot injury. It's going to require surgery. He's going to miss some time to start the year. Like, we already knew that Alave was going to be a target volume kind of guy and it looks like even more so they've now like surprisingly year. just kind of like avoided adding to that wide receiver room they're they're yeah. comfortable with Alave and Shahid and they're just gonna yeah. let it be but uh, here's here's my thing actually it's interesting you went to uh, as you were talking about that and the last final point why I have him at 16 when I'm looking at what's gonna really define typically a top 12 receiver from like a wide receiver two it ends up coming down more often than not to touchdowns yeah. Chris Olave, five touchdowns last year, four the year yeah. prior. Last year, 12 red zone targets. I actually don't think that number, without a lot of things changing, is going to be like a double-digit type number. That's, I think, another thing for me when this – just this offense you in general. Do you think with that 12 – and I'm just curious. I, I, yeah. I don't even know how I feel strongly about it right now. But do you think with the 12 red zone targets, there's room for positive regression there? I mean, you said five out of 12 targets he converted. 
Well, no, he right. He had five touchdowns. They weren't all red zone. They weren't all red zone touchdowns. Like got he, you, he got had, you, got you, got you, got you. But um, well, uh, that's, that's low, yeah. Yeah, I mean, thirty three, and it, he didn't earn any differently. So in they 22. were two. They were from out. They were deep. He had, touchdowns. yeah, I think he had two or three touchdowns that were outside the twenty. Yeah. Got you. He had in red zone targets. He had eleven the year prior, number forty. That's like to me again. That's where could, my, Mike just, Evans is a big, right. big body red zone target. Like that's that just might be the player he is, and we're looking at it in the face and not like kind of accepting it. I hate to say it, like because I, Ohio State guy, I love Chris Olave, but I I'm a little bit lower than consensus because of that. Those are I think it's fair. I think th- I think really like once you're at this part of the draft, like we just did the underdog stream, and I was sitting at did I take a lot? I feel like I took a lot of a at the two hundred four maybe or the two hundred five. Uh-huh. I don't remember who I ended up taking. Uh, no, it was oh I took Ayuk. The point remains though, like when you're in that early second or like mid second, late second, all these wide receivers from almost Ayuk down to Pittman feel like they're kind of. Yeah, they kind of blend in. They, they they blend in together. They're they're a giant tier. So like Alave at twelve down to sixteen for me. Like you, you want to make the case Evans over him. You want to make the case Waddle over him. Like London Ayuk. I I got really no problem with it. I guess. Yeah. And and kind of to piggyback onto that, like I think I have a tier there where I have probably my largest tier is that tier we're talking about, where it's Alave, Ayuk, London, Evans, yep. Collins. Like uh, I have a lot of these guys in one tier. So probably the smartest thing to do would be to take the last of the tier or, or kind of let your league mates reach on their guys and then you kind of consume. I mean, the problem is like wh- like me in the draft, when you're at the 204 and you don't really have a choice but to take someone at the front of the tier, yep. then you got to kind of claim your stamp there and say like, I like I Alave a little bit more, so I got to yeah. fucking no, no, gotta hit sure. him there, you know? I think there's a group of like, I feel very confident, like haves and haves nots. And, and it's more so there's just a big jumbled tier of guys that I don't necessarily, there's some guys I prefer versus others, but yeah. there's a lot of similar, I think, upside to a lot of the guys in this like I'd say 11 12 13 to like honestly probably the almost the bottom of this list maybe not quite to the 25 but <laughs> at least the 20 something no uh, I don't I don't know maybe for me outside of if you told me like any of these Which guys actually, ripped off 1200 yards this year I don't know if I would not believe it for any of what's them. I think it's actually that's actually a perfect segue like okay now that we kind of get that and we kind of somewhat agree. Let's talk about the players that we are wanting to bet on or think could actually catapult up in this list, or players in general that we're differing on. Here. Yeah, I mean, you see, I got I got DK and Cooper Cup pretty significantly. Well, not maybe not significantly higher, but you know they're yellow on the chart, so they 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 stand out to me a little bit. I was gonna say I was actually gonna have you talk uh, about Cooper Cup and uh, yeah, talk DK too while you got it. DK at seventeen is high. Yeah, DK at seventeen is high. I I, I think it not presents crazy, a ceiling though. that we really haven't seen yet, and I I do think the new uh, <clears throat> offense coming in there is gonna be so much more pass heavy and lock it maybe on the decline jsn we don't really know if he's going to be a true game changer yeah. in the offense so i feel like dk could step into like the clear i think he's been the alpha for some time but i don't know that the statistics or like the target rate has really shown that this could be a year where i think statistically he be, he he like breaks off as the alpha alpha there and i think a dk metcalf type upside is pretty fucking large so yeah love him there I, and again i think the players that you're kind of scouring him around all have similar ish outlooks yep. and i feel like dk is kind of a, a cool player to bet on so him and cooper cup i mean the thing with cooper cup is i'm kind of willing to just write off a lot of last season with the injuries you come into yeah. the year completely banged up you're forcing yourself to you know play onto the field come onto the field early before you're ready to get it and and that resulted in like more injuries happening and more injuries happening before you know it piles up and it becomes a problem and you dropped us at last podcast just talking about how cooper cup and puka over the last half of the season their target shares were same thing. Damn, yeah, Puka outperformed. Obviously, like he was a little bit more efficient, but yeah. if you're a little bit hampered. You're still getting the targets. Like Stafford and Cup have an unbelievable chemistry, and like I said, Cup is not someone who relies on crazy athleticism, crazy route running skills. He's just very smart, knows how to sit down in this in the zone. McVay just like gives him layups all day long. So Puka takes some of them, but I still think Cooper Cup can have a really really nice ceiling. Yeah, the DK one actually. I was just kind of thinking about it and the the cycle he's been on, at least from the dynasty perspective, which isn't always the same as redraft. So his rookie season and him coming out the combine, people thought he had no agility. Remember that? He ended up having a really nice finish to his rookie season and the playoffs really put a stamp on it. Yeah. The next year with Russ, he started cooking. We started seeing like the real raw upside. He was like wide receiver one in dynasty. conversation. I remember, dynasty. I remember that, yeah. And it's what's so funny about it, it's like dynasty so fickle where it feels like for now a few years, people have been trying to push 
like DK is not really the alpha or can't really be that when it's kind of a false narrative in general, but it got me thinking about the targets you were saying. He's always played in the same style offense, which doesn't really pass the ball at a high rate. Mm -hmm. Uh Russ, uh, these last few offenses with Pete Carroll, they're lower mid volume pass offenses. If, if this new offense really is chucking it, and DK has actually been earning a lot of targets. He could end up being a 150, 160 target guy. And then, holy that would shit. Be crazy. What would happen yeah. then? Because he's another dude who's actually a lot of earned, downfield targets. Yeah. Just last year, he earned one, uh, not 2022, he earned 141. So that was, his, was that his big year? Like yeah. 1,300? So he had, no, he had uh, 1,048. It was just meh as far as, got a lot, a lot of targets, of but just not, not a lot <laughs> doing with it. Yeah. I mean, I just think about that. That's, I think this, you actually are going to make me change my, my DK ranking here a little bit just for the upside he might possess. I, I'm I like that. actually really intrigued by what this Washington Huskies offense is going to look like in the NFL with the Seattle Seahawks because that's where the offensive coordinator is coming from. And mm-hmm. we all know the story, at least people who have played Dynasty or people who have just followed college football in general, you kind of know how good that Washington passing offense has been over the last couple of years. We've had multiple guys who have been – High producers in that offense, Jalen McMillan, Jalen Polk, Roma Dunze. There's room for a lot of people if it is the same type of offense, which I'm expecting it to be, for there to be a lot of room for people to eat. And I'm just excited, man. I th- I think people who believe in JSN, I think they might get what they want. I think people who believe in DK, they can get what they want. And I think there's still room for Tyler Lockett to have a decent season and be a value for redraft teams as well. I agree with that. It's, uh, it's going to be a fun offense to see kind of how it plays out. They have a lot of like, cool pieces. We're yet to see everything kind of like come together yeah. and really get sticky there. Yeah, the tempo will make it fun, I think, for All right, sure. So you got, a, you, got, you got a sore thumb sticking out with Amari Cooper, you know? Yeah. All the way up at 18. I got him at 23. I will say I've been slowly kind of moving him up a little bit as as the weeks go by, like one spot and then one spot and then one spot. Yep. You're you're in on, on Cooper, obviously, as a, uh, strong, as a Browns Pretty fan. strong. Coming off a career year. Well, he had a career yardage year, um, and that was actually – uh, largely because of that 250-some yard explosion game he had with Flacco. Mm-hmm. Interestingly enough, he missed two games last year, too. Uh, missed the last two games of the season. So mm. two, two years ago, he was wide receiver 10. In the Browns offense with Jacoby Brissett in a rusty-ass, terrible-looking version of Deshaun Watson when he came back. Last year, career year as far as yardage goes, but again, like similar to this Chris Olave conversation, he only had five touchdowns last year. Last year, they had five quarterbacks that they were playing for him. Yeah. When DTR and... PJ uh, Walker were there. Like those were those were four of these weeks where his usage was not even his usage. His yardage was awful. He was like wide receiver ninety three eighty something. Those are just like outliers uh, uh, weeks I think for a guy that talented and it's gonna get this much volume. I think if the touchdowns to positive regression are even close to seven eight like it was the year prior. This is a guy that for most part you're able to get in like that late twenty range. Like I, I put him at eighteen to mark my stamp on him. But basically, if I'm in a draft, I'm just. I'm kind of figuring out where I'm at, where my slot is. Like, where do I have to be to get Amari Cooper and make sure I secure him? I'd probably be, you know, a half round or a round ahead of ADP. But he's a guy that I think I really, really want to have. I think that this offense is, whether it's good or not, Stefanski wants to pass the ball, and Amari Cooper's just going to eat. As long as Watson stays healthy, it's going to be a much better quarterback play than it was last year. You think? I do. It was a horrible with horrible with DTR and uh, P.J. Walker. He had it was horrible with Watson, he, too. It wasn't nearly as bad. He had four starts with P.J. Walker and, and DTR. They were like, this team literally couldn't pass the ball. 100 and some no, yards. That's fair. Oh. Those games were bad. I, I mean, yeah. I, the reason I think the industry's down on him is like most of his big games came with Flacco. I think for the most part, Watson, we're just... It's, had a 50 point week in our championship weeks which was like what yeah. can i ask you guys a why fourth of his year's production can i ask you why is a guy that can give you a 50 point week a bad thing it's not that's what but, but i feel like that's kind of the way not Joe flacco gave us a 50 point week fair but like i feel like there's like uh well we take that out like why well, i don't understand that part no you know I, I, mean? I don't i don't say take it out but it i mean when you have something skew that much where you do how many total points did he have on the year if you have it. Uh, yeah, 261. 261. So you got a fifth of his car- or of his season's production in one game. And yes, it was in our championship. So thank you, Amari Cooper, because you probably won some people some trophies. But the reality is, like, if you do take that out, and I know I just said let's not take that out, <laughs> you are looking at a lot worse of a year, and that came in one game. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, for I sure. But, like, if we're going to say take yeah. out the best game, take out the four games where he had – like XFL quarterback. Fair. Even if you Fair. take out a 50 point game though, and then you have 210 points in 14 games, I feel like that's still like 15 PPR points per game. Yeah. It's that's still rock fucking solid. I mean, yeah. with those four bad games included. Also, there. mind you, so that was the wide receiver one overall for the week, with mm-hmm. week winning. The week prior, he was wide receiver 14, and he had two weeks inside the top 10 as well to that. 
despite like all this bad quarterback play. So he was wide receiver 10 and four actually with Watson as the quarterback last year. So I, th- I, I think that with Watson, you can't really project him to go back to the old Houston days. I'm not doing that. Yeah. But I think he, at least if he's somewhat serviceable, is going to get Amari Cooper a lot better targets, uh, more consistent than what he had across the whole season. I will say, because I... I'm the low man here on Cooper, and I don't even think necessarily it's against Cooper. I'm just having a hard time right now deciphering Cleveland as a whole, the whole Cleveland Browns offense. And I I almost feel like I'm kind of avoiding most Cleveland Browns options just at their current costs. I just am not really in on those players just because maybe there is so much uneasiness with them. I don't really hate their – I almost feel like that uneasiness is factored into a lot of their ADP, though. Like – Cooper, who went nuts last year, is our 23. Watson, I feel like, is a pretty good value in drafts right now. Like you're getting him at the QB, like, 20, 23 or some bullshit like that. Even Njoku, who had a good year, is, like, tight end 10-ish, I feel fine. He like, Judy, a, I'm staying away from. Yeah, Those okay. other guys I am. Jerome Ford, we were talking about, is a good yeah. value. I, he's the one I like the most. I, I, I'll i draft a lot. Yeah, I feel like the uncertainty Ford. is as, as pushed into the realm where it's, like, I feel – they're like a good enough team that they're going to have multiple producers, you know, that play well to the point where it's like bet, bet on the guys that we know are talented and they'll probably be the ones that end up producing well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just, I guess when I'm looking at it too, 132 and 128 targets the last two years, like this is just his two years in Cleveland, 1160, 1250, nine touchdowns, five touchdowns. Like if you, if you just yeah. averaged out the last two years, even with the bad quarterback play, all of it, he's like a top 15 wide receiver. I bet you over the last two years for sure. And the situation is not any worse at all. It just feels like a uh, a tired narrative somehow with the Browns or Cooper or something. I feel like we've had this Cooper conversation 20 times this offseason. Yeah, well, I mean, we've I made a lot of dynasty <laughs> content together. The, but, the, but the redraft portion is the only reason why, obviously. Yeah, you, yeah. You're not drafting him because he's 30, you yeah. know? Yeah, no, I'm, uh, I'm definitely probably leaning more towards where you have him than where we, we have him in consensus now. He's someone that I think is going to move up uh, a little bit here. Yeah, so I, uh, I'm anchoring us a little bit, not going to lie. Yeah, where do you fun. have him at, by the way? 27. I mean, you still have them in the same range. Again, we talked about it, how you could value a lot of these guys similarly or higher. Yeah. Let's let's have a conversation about the Houston wide receiver trio in general. Oh, interesting. We got Nico across the board 15 with very little variance in our rankings. Diggs is consensus 24. I have him at 24. Adam at 28. Andrew at 21. Tank Dell's not even in our top 28, which is going to rattle some feathers here. Mm-hmm. There's going to be the tank truthers that are upset about it. Yeah, and listen, I don't I don't really have a problem with people getting upset. Like, realistically, you, you just had a great rookie year. You're a really explosive, exciting receiver attached to one of the most accurate QBs, basically, in the NFL at this point. And uh, I think the narrative... Is, is, is a clear one. You know, we've talked so much about Dynasty. Like, we've done so many Dynasty podcasts that we all know each other's takes on the Houston wide receiver core. I wonder if there's maybe a little bit of that pouring into this. But I think looking at the rankings, the story we're telling is Nico's the clear alpha right now. And I think if you look at the way he produced last year, plus, you know, just him as a separator, you know, contract. we use... Yeah, he got the contract extension. Uh, Matt Harmon's RP profile on him is showing that he's a fucking elite separator. Diggs, I think we're all kind of in agreement that he's probably got a year or two left of playing good football, but he's not the separator downfield that he was. And if Nico's the one, then how high is Diggs' real ceiling? Tank Dell is probably the odd man out from a statistical standpoint. I'm clearly the high guy right now on on Stefan Diggs, but not by too much. I mean, you have him at 24, I have him at 21. Mm-hmm. I just don't I, – I just don't believe – that the Houston Texans, they trade for a guy like Stephon Diggs, knowing the baggage that can come with a guy like Stephon Diggs, where if you're not feeding him the football, he's going to let you know about it. And True. it just feels like you don't make that move unless your plan is to make him a big part of your offense. And so mm-hmm. it is only on a one-year deal. They've restructured it to where it's a one-year kind of yeah. – just prove it for Stefan Diggs. And, yes, we all know the story about last year where down the stretch, Diggs did not do us any favors for our fantasy football teams. But that being said – Stephon Diggs still was a top 12 or 13 wide receiver from a fantasy points per game standpoint. He was still a highly targeted wide receiver. And even though I think those numbers he are going to come so down good in the first half. a little I was, bit, I was gonna he's going to be a big part of this offense. And, and I just cannot move him any lower. I, I think he has potential to be one of the best value picks in all of redraft leagues this year. I think there will be a portion of... Which, which always, almost always is the case with Diggs, it feels like. Every single year, for the last like five years basically, there's always a window throughout the year that we're like, oh, fuck, Diggs is, gonna, is the wide receiver one in fantasy. It was the beginning of last year. There's always like windows of four or six weeks. where, And I think that's probably going to happen with Diggs at one point this year. Yep. But at the end of the day, I kind of feel like 
I mean, it, it realistically, it's not just Nico and Diggs and Tank. It's also they extended Dalton Schultz, who played mm-hmm. really well for them last year. Joe Brought in Mixon. Joe Mixon, who's going to get 18 to 20 touches a game. Like, there's a lot of su- really good fucking players in this lineup where I, I don't really know that I'm confident in saying that I feel like Diggs is going to go and put up more than, like, 1,006. And, th- and that's part of the argument, I think, for why... I personally don't have Tank Dell in my top 25, and it's because something has to give in this offense. Yeah. We don't think that C.J. Stroud is throwing for 6,000 yards and 50 touchdowns. That's not going to happen, and if that were to happen, obviously every guy would be in the top 25. But That would be a fun uh, That would be a fun draft next year. C.J. Stroud goes out and throws 6,050. I mean, <laughs> I mean like, do we, have, do we have four Houston Texans drafted within the top, like, 15 next Probably. year? Probably, but that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I'm obviously being facetious when I say that, but, like, I, I just think you Ooh. like the vocab. Yeah. I didn't know go. what word you were. Thought you were going to use hyperbolic. No, that a look, I, I, I got a little bit of college knowledge <laughs> in the <laughs> brain, but um, the reality is like something has to give. And I think, unfortunately, you, I mean, you already said it. Tankdale kind of feels like he's the odd man out. And if I'm projecting them, it's going to be Nico, Diggs, Dell. And unfortunately, I don't have room for three Texans in my top 25. Makes sense. Yeah, I think you guys already covered a lot of it here. Diggs, to the first point of the season part, uh, they, they had a coaching staff switch and, like, yeah. the entire philosophy of how they ran things in the second half, which ended up working out for them a lot better as a football team, which makes sense of why they move on from him. But I, I caught this on Yahoo. Matt Harmon actually interviewed him talking about this. The first half of his season, so for the first eight weeks, he was on pace to have his best fantasy finish and his best career finish. And he was asking him, like, with the, everything that went down and then completely changing from that, and basically they're not throwing the ball, especially your way. He goes from, like, having an unreal season to wide receiver 53, 54, 52. It was bad, yeah. Like, so I guess, like, I, I definitely agree to the point you make. I, I think he's, um, with his age, he's not the, like, field stretcher he once was. But I don't necessarily know that he can't separate and still can't, like, be a really damn good receiver, just a different version than the young one of him. So think my, of what Keenan Allen did last year. Yeah, my, my ranking is a little more reflective of a, a lot of the things that you guys talked about. I, I kind of agree with uh, pretty wholeheartedly. My ranking, though, is just that, like, I've actually gone over the numbers. If, if they completely target uh, everybody downfield, like C.J. Stroud, the A dot for Tank Dell, Nico Collins, and uh, Noah Brown last year were, like, top 10. They're just, he's just chucking the ball downfield. Like, those are 15-yard-plus. Yeah. If they have it where these three guys are all getting massive, uh, really good targets, but downfield, maybe they actually are relevant. But my my ranking is more reflective of the fact that I don't I don't feel confident enough to predict anything other than I don't think Nico's going away. Yeah, you brought up a point with Keenan Allen, and uh, another individual video I'm working on is like six six guys that I'm just like super uneasy pressing the draft button on, and they're not dudes that I'm like avoiding at all costs. But Diggs is on that list, and. Basically, like, when I evaluate the players in that video, I'm like, this is why I'm uneasy, but, like, this is also why you should think about drafting him. And Diggs, same, it was the same kind of conversation last year. It's like Keenan Allen, like, even his reception perception profile was, like, on its way down going into last year, and then all of a sudden he just fucking blows up and has his best career year. So with Diggs, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it, and, you know, we say something's got to give, and it reminded me of the, the Rams' early days of McVay mm-hmm. when it was – Cup, Woods, and Brandon Cooks. Yep. And all, all three right. of those guys were top 25 drafted redraft guys. And every year, two of them hit, one of them gave. Yep. So, yeah. like, I yeah. think that will happen. Predicting who that's going to be is tough. The you know, I think we have to use context clues. Like, Nico feels like the one that for sure will probably be one of the two that hit. And then you kind of just flip a coin. And the fact that Tank Dell is going so much later than Diggs feels like I'd almost rather gamble on that if I can get him three rounds later. Well, but. that was the strategy I think a lot of people were using with Rams wide receivers for a long time. I remember there was multiple years where I was just sitting at, you know, in my home redraft league, and it was like, okay, which one of these guys falls? Yeah. Because whoever my league mates take, I'll take the cheapest of the three and just live with the results. Yeah. And I think that might be the same here with Houston. Yeah. I, I, so I have Tank Dell at 32. I don't know if you guys remember how far you have him down. But like, I don't uh, know where I have him. The, re- the reason I say it, like, there was T. Higgins. There's a couple guys uh, that I feel pretty good about this season. But I don't really have a, a huge disparity between Diggs and Tank. I, I think that this is the order that I would draft them currently with what I know. I, I do think the level of attachment, not that I didn't think Nico was going to get paid, but once they did that, it's like, all right, Nico is now, clearly they've already made this 
call that they really believe in him. He's going to be attached to C.J. Stroud. Not that Tank Dell won't get a contract or something, but the level of attachment they have in Diggs, they basically with that one year, to your point, the Diva stuff, you come in doing that Diva stuff in this Texans team after you had a bad finish last year, that would be really dumb for him to do because now his career going on to 31 next year would be odd. So I, I think if he... If he just shows up and plays football and is not doing the antics, he could end up being a really nice player for this team. But I don't know that that's yeah. going to be the way it shakes I, out. I have hoped for many, many years that Stefan Diggs would stop with the diva stuff, but I've been disappointed every time well, he does it. Well, he hasn't <laughs> always done that, though. And, I mean, uh, and he, I mean he got, he's gotten paid. He's had great seasons as yes, a whole. But, I mean, there was – a lot of time in Minnesota where he was tweeting about Kirk Cousins, and then there's times in Buffalo where he's taking shots at Josh Allen, but meanwhile they're best buddies supposedly. But it's just, he does it all the time. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised that if you know six weeks into the season he doesn't see double-digit targets, he's out there talking about they're not using me correctly and Houston doesn't want me to be here, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, it could, it could for sure get messy. Uh, With only one year left, I just feel like he's on a, he, he knowingly is on a short leash. I don't know if he's going to act any different or not. He's made a lot of money. I don't know if he cares too much. Yeah, that's fair. He's proud, I, though. I love I don't, proud, though. I, 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 I'm definitely not going to try to act like I know the psyche of that man. I, I know that <laughs> sounds very negative. For the record, I love Stefan Diggs. But anyways, yeah. Uh, we'll cut that out. No, keep it. We know you don't love him. You, like, you no, edit, edit it to where out. it's like, I hate Stefan yes. Diggs. It's like <laughs> you just start talking mad crap about somebody, and then it's... Oh. I love this guy, though. Diggs right. is one of my favorite receivers ever. Anybody Anyways. else on the list? Anyone else you want to talk about that either was just just missed the list or missed the top 25? I feel like there's a little bit of this discrepancy guy, right. on Michael Pittman Jr. We have a 19, a 15, a 22. Yeah, uh, that was one I was going to get to. I I, how do we kind of feel about that Pittman? I, I'm higher I want to say, Adam, you're does. the 15, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And I'm the low. I'm the 22. I was going to ask, like, I mean, obviously me being 15 seems like, again, I'm the uh, the crazy one. Why are people down? I don't understand why people are down on Pittman or, like, why he's not viewed closer to the Brandon Ayuk tier is, I guess, my question. I, I think here's my struggle with Pittman right now. And I, I've been a very big Pittman truther for many years. But for some reason, I find myself now sitting here looking at this and I'm the low man. And I think it comes down to kind of what we've talked about on our last episode that we did here where they continue to add talent around him it's always kind of been just Michael Pittman Jr and when are they going to find the guy and when are they going to find the guy they had Josh Downs last year Josh Downs had a pretty solid season they had Adonai Mitchell who I think all three of us really like as a prospect Anthony Richardson as much as I love him for fantasy football still an unproven passer at the NFL level sure I think there could be a lot of rushing upside in this offense with Jonathan Taylor and Anthony Richardson in that backfield, maybe a little bit less passing volume than we've seen in years past. I think all of these things considered have just caused me to bump him down just a tiny bit more. We have him as our 18 overall. I have him at 22. I, I think there's definitely an argument where I could move him anywhere within this tier and be comfortable with it, but I just think there's enough risk with him that I lean the upside of some of the other guys. Like, I, I think about where I have Devontae Smith. Like, I think Devontae Smith has shown us enough in that offense where I might lean Devontae, even with a guy like DK Metcalf. We talked about him as well. DJ sure. Moore. I just lean those guys over Pittman, Pittman right yeah, now. Yeah, Pittman, like, it felt another, you know, if you're watching the Colts last year, he felt, I don't want to say utilized the wrong way, but I feel like they didn't necessarily take advantage of strengths that he also has on the field how so I actually kind of agree with that he point. was just a very high volume player and they got the ball in his hands around the line of scrimmage a ton like he'd have a ton of games where he was like eight for 70 Pittman was a fucking phenomenal downfield playmaker at USC yep. and he's a good route runner down the field so if they're going to use him they keep adding weapons where targets are going to go but this is I, I don't think it's a fucking surprise that these this is going to be one of the most run heavy teams in the NFL if not the single most run heavy with JT and Anthony Richardson so it's like you take this guy who it feels like the way that they've used him is at a high volume low a dot type of player and then you just add in volume things around him that his volume is going to come down if they decide like a rich has got a fucking explosive arm let's use Pittman down the field more I think this could we could end up looking fucking stupid if they yeah. if they allow Pittman to go downfield. My my problem is that we have not seen that, and I don't know if there's anything that suggests that that is going to be the change this year. So we got a guy who's very high volume in an offense that now I think is going to be super fucking run heavy with added target weapons. It makes me a little bit nervous about his ceiling, also. Okay, I mean I I guess I'm, I hear your concerns, and I. I think probably that's where a lot of it is echoing. Like, it's funny you brought up Devontae Smith because uh, the Shane Steichen thing is just so such a clear parallel. Like, how he utilized Jalen Hurts and the fact that you had A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith eating 
in a run heavy offense. Yeah. The cr- the crazy part is like uh, when they brought in they keep bringing it Josh Downs, Adonai Mitchell. I think they're trying to make the offense more dynamic. To your point, it, it felt especially with like a rich out of the lineup or with Taylor banged up, it kind of felt predictable, one dimensional. Mm-hmm. I think they're trying to open it up, but the the interesting part is no matter what they do as far as bringing weapons in, the constant is like this dude is getting. Right or wrong, just outrageous target volume. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like the the I, the I actually don't see any risk with him because the like the floor is just insane. Do you realize this guy who's a monster, six four two thirty or whatever? He's had like four touchdowns in all these years too. Like last year he was a wide receiver thirteen with only four TDs and being used probably a little bit incorrectly. I think that the floor, if the targets come down, is probably still like a top twenty receiver. But that's also not baking in. I think the thing that I'm really baking in is if A. Rich is able to uh, really take this offense to another level with him and Taylor, if you start having to focus attention to that backfield, like Pittman could be in a totally different situation with upside that we've never seen from him. Uh, That's fair. For the record, too, for clarity as well, when we rank these, we rank these as half PPR. I think in a full point PPR with the volume that he's been receiving, definitely I think he'd That's be higher than my 22. super fair point. Yeah, half PPR. Uh, by the way, half PPR 15, full PPR 13 last year was Pittman's finishes. But the, cra- the other crazy part, like we saw so little of A. Rich fully healthy in Pittman. That's why. I wish we got to see a little but bit more of them do, together do you know, and, and A. Rich like taking shots downfield. Yeah. Like, and obviously everything with A. Rich you're going to use now becomes super small sample size and no one's going to want to hear it. But like first game, uh, off the rip, like basically what they were planning to do, like Pittman had 11 targets. Yeah. I struggle with him having a low floor. And I think that if I'm drafting him at wide receiver 15 here, I'm probably going to be able to retain maybe a little bit lower floor. But the, I think the upside is – Probably as high as almost anybody in this range for me personally, based on what I've seen from him and what this offense upside could be. That's why I got him at 15. Peter Staines. I, w- I was going to ask one more here. Last one. Malik. We're kind of all similar, but like 23, 24, 27. Yeah, Nick, we, Nick, I mean, he's we outside can talk your about, top. He's outside about of both him. rookie wide receivers. We got Marv up at nine there, uh, mm-hmm, all across yeah. the board. I think we're all just kind of on the same page. Kyler's a good quarterback. Marv's going into like an unbelievable target ceiling situation. Yeah. R- ridiculous talent. Like, wouldn't surprise anyone if he just pops off or. 11, 12, 1,300 yards right away, I 140, 50 targets. I'm almost expecting it. I mean, clearly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. If he goes below 1,000, I'd be very surprised. It's kind of crazy yeah. we all had him at nine. Yeah. That's pretty interesting. But, I mean, yeah, I got him top 10. I think his talent, his draft capital, the Kyler situation, they need an alpha. I think it's going to be great for him. I guess Maliki. I believe really strongly in Malik's talent. Do we think he's talented enough to overcome this situation in a redraft sense, like this season? I've said it on multiple occasions this offseason in our Dynasty content and in my own Dynasty content, but the way that I am viewing Malik Neighbors, I think he is super talented. Obviously, in Dynasty, I want a lot of Malik Neighbors, but the way that I view this is kind of early on Drake London and Garrett Wilson, and both of those guys were obviously great talents. We all think highly of them now. Not the best quarterback situation, and so I think we've seen Garrett Wilson. He's kind of been a 15 to 25 type of range guy we've seen London kind of do the same thing I I think Garrett's probably a really good comp because Mm -hmm. Garrett like Malik are both playmakers with the ball in their hands so Malik could be a high target guy that doesn't just rely on like the accuracy of the targets necessarily it's like he's gonna he's gonna have to eat what he kills you know what I'm saying like he's gonna have to get the ball in his hands anywhere and end up being the dude who picks up eight 17 60 yards after the catch kind of thing but like I I just want to look at like Garrett Wilson and I don't know if we have that pulled up but Point like, finishes? Yeah. He was wider – points per game, wide receiver 33 and 31 in his first two seasons. So, wild. like, to think of how talented of a player Garrett Wilson is, yep. but he couldn't really overcome the quarterback situation because of how bad it was. I don't think Daniel Jones is as bad as Zach Wilson. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, that's why we kind of have him flirting here with 25, top 25. But to put him anywhere, I think, in that 10 to – 15, 10 to 20 range, I feel like that's irresponsible from a redraft lens. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, we were talking about this, I think, last night on our Dynasty uh, podcast that we filmed. And Daniel Jones has been the QB for five years, and the single best fantasy wide receiver that he supported was Darius Slayton at wide receiver 37 one year. Obviously, Malik's a whole nother fucking Time. talent level to it, but it just goes to show he's thrown for, never thrown for over 3,300 passing yards, hasn't had more than 15 passing touchdowns in a year since his rookie year five years ago. Yeah. So it's like Daniel Jones, you, we still might like him for fantasy because he scoots a little bit and he's mobile, even though he's coming off the ACL, so maybe not even. His passing has never been there to support real players. And like, again, Malik can make the plays after the catch, 
Same thing with Garrett Wilson, though. Like, there's only so much of that you could do to, yeah. to bring a ceiling to what you're he, doing. He has to be so special yeah. every time he touches the football for him to be valuable. And, and that's such a tough position to put a rookie wide receiver in in the NFL. Yeah. So, uh, on the Dynasty channel, I made a video last Friday coming out about – Basically, the S-tier wide receivers in the last five years. And I think the NFL, when you're drafting that type of draft capital, is saying a lot about the talent level. I mm-hmm. think the interesting part is, like, last year, if you go to 2022 class. So, 21 and 20, there was none. 22, you had – I'm sorry, 21, you had uh, Jamar Chase, Jalen Waddell, Devontae Smith. Mm-hmm. 2022, you had Drake London and Garrett Wilson. Mm-hmm. Those are the more recent ones where – they both got volume, but just horrible inefficiency. I definitely think the range of outcomes, like Malik could get a bunch of targets that mean nothing. Yeah. Jalen Waddle, though, is the one, to me, where I see, like, if you wanted to point to him being able to... Overcome it? Yeah. I, I think you could be looking at that with maybe even a little bit of extra. The the A dot was super low. You're just getting the ball in his hands. Tua was his QB then, though, or yeah. not? Uh, it was a combi- Wasn't it a combination? It, it was Tua and Fitzpatrick. Yeah, Fitzpatrick in the okay. first part, right. So I'm thinking now, I'm, I'm starting to think back of those like high end receivers like Chris Olave, good rookie year. Uh, he had, I think his rookie year, he had what, Jamison Dalton? He didn't have Derek Carr yet. Correct. Did he? It was uh, Dalton for the, yeah, Dalton yeah. and Jamis, yep. Yeah, I just think the, those guys, yeah, they're, they're probably around the Daniel Jones tier, maybe a little bit above it as it relates to like fantasy wide receivers. But I do, I mean, listen, there's nothing else going on in that Giants offense. So who well, knows? The, the reason I say it, like Fitzpatrick had a his first six weeks that they, they pivoted to two after the bye. But remember, he was coming off of that uh, really serious hip injury. Like um, he was. He does. He didn't definitely look nearly as good as he does now, or as confident. I, I I don't think Daniel Jones is the greatest quarterback. I just think that this offense. You use the six overall pick on a guy. Force feeding is out. It's going to be just targets galore yeah. for him. Let me, so let me I think he's you. I think he's talented enough to maybe return value. Let's say uh, the Chargers took Malik at five instead, instead of letting him fall to six. Yeah. Now the Chargers, same coaching staff, still Harbaugh, Roman, whatever. His underdog line again is at thirty six hundred passing yards. If Malik is there. Uh, I, I, like if Malik is there, I don't think the line is at that point either. To no, be definitely, definitely not. It's probably closer to like 38, 39, but still low for a Herbert line. And like, I might be jumping your question here, but where I would be putting him if he was on the Chargers is probably sandwiched between Nico Collins and Jalen Waddle. Okay. I was going to say I might even go higher than that, to be honest <laughs> with you. I think I would take Malik over like Alave if he was with Herbert. Yeah, I, w- I would put, but he's solidly in that. Uh, that tier the, the, the top of or in for the mix sure. of that tier for damn sure. Yeah, yeah, that would be fucking fun spot. But just to go to show you wanted. like why Malik, we're so low on Malik, not because of the town, but just because of the you know, the landing spot yeah. that he ended up in. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and for the record, like I remember Jalen Waddle's super inefficient season, 140 targets. Like it didn't really feel the greatest, but he was wide receiver 15. Like I think Malik could end up being a top 20 receiver just off volume. But to the point you talked about, the the flip side, Garrett Wilson, tremendous player talent. If the if it's so inefficient, it doesn't matter. And well, you know what. Malik Neighbors and Trevon Diggs are talking shit to each other on Twitter right now, so we'll at least get fireworks in uh, nice. week four. Yeah. Tw- All right. Twitter, baby. Well, let let's, us know what you thought. Was it, did we miss anybody? Let us yeah, know. Did we miss anybody? Uh, and, and also, like as we're doing different types of videos, like the buy, sell, hold, if you have specific players you want us to talk about, always drop them in the comments. We'll try to uh, Pull you know, some from there. get a feed from there. And we'll be doing the running back version of this next video. So subscribe to the channel if you are – New here, redrafts, content, five days a week going forward. Hey. Love you. We out here. Smoochies. Go Browns.